Wendy looked around at all the old familiar faces trying to find inner peace. That place where she felt safe, but it was proving elusive. I see, she thought. Today is the day of the crusade. Improve the world just one small day. Push an anthill this my memory day. She shuddered, but pulled herself together. Suddenly she realized the weight of the two tiny steel balls in her hand. Automatically, with practiced ease, she began to move them around each other in her palm. The moment she concentrated on the smooth movement of the balls, her friend Pam entered the room, fidgety as ever. Wendy looked her in the eye and invited her to come over. Pamela finished her lesson and approached, smiling warmly. Hi, Wendy. Can I get you anything? No, Pam. Today is the day that it's me doing something for you. I need about a half hour of your time, unrelated to work, in a quiet place. Can we do that? Sure, Wendy. But not today. There's a staff meeting later when I usually take a break. How about tomorrow? A look of disappointment appeared on Wendy's face. She had to set herself up for this conversation. It had taken her a few days, and so she hadn't slept a wink the last few nights. The thought of another sleepless night was traumatizing. She clutched the stress balls in her hand and made a decision, a look of determination replaced by a look of frustration. This is important, Pam. This is about the man I saw you making out with at the back door last week. He's too young to be your husband. Those simple words made Pamela freeze. She remembered the day her friend Wendy was talking about. She had very carefully kissed Randall, one of the cooks, where no one from the first floor could see them. She didn't know they were visible from the upper floors. The revelation was embarrassing and very, very dangerous. If word got out to her husband, she could lose the idyllic family life she had worked so hard to build. Still, it's none of Wendy's business. What I have with Randall isn't that serious, Wendy. It's just a little fun when, shut up, Pam, we need to talk, now, today. Shocked by Wendy's demanding tone, Pamela looked at her friend as if seeing her for the first time. She had to fight the reflexive urge to tell Wendy to back off and mind her own business. In Wendy's hand, the marbles clattered loudly against each other. With an expression of extreme distress, Wendy spoke again. Please, Pam, you need to hear what you're risking. You need to hear my story. Bullshit, Pam thought. More like you need to tell me your story. Take the responsibility off your back. Regardless, she decided to be reassured. Okay, Wendy. Let's go to the tanning salon. It should be quiet this time of day. I'll just organize the lights, and then I'll meet you there in ten minutes or so. Okay? Wendy nodded and watched Pam fidget and then headed to the meeting place. Pamela caught Wendy there at the appointed time, a look of tension on her face. Pam was annoyed. Randall was just a little entertainment, a harmless distraction that took nothing away from Jake and the boys. She sat down next to Wendy, prepared to defend her actions but Wendy beat her to it. I don't want to know if you've already slept with a guy. It doesn't matter. I can only imagine the delusional arguments you've been making, probably as much as I did. The remark was so out of character for Wendy that Pam was shocked into silence. I, uh, I cheated on my husband, and it cost me everything. Pamela watched as Wendy's eyes clouded over and unfocused. Wendy's right hand rubbed the stress balls furiously and machine-like. As a nurse, Pam knew the balloons were a distraction, probably recommended by a counselor or psychiatrist. She didn't really want to hear what Wendy had to say. It hardly had anything to do with her. She was very careful with Randall, and besides, they hadn't gone all the way there yet. If they went further, and that was still a big if, what was the worst that could happen? She'd have to soothe some of the ruffled feathers of his ego. Maybe eat some humble pie. She couldn't imagine her husband divorcing her. He would never risk losing access to his children. But what was wrong with listening to Wendy? Obviously, she needed to spill her guts. Pam waited patiently. I don't make a big deal out of it, but I used to be a doctor. I, uh, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me start at the beginning. I met my future husband right after I finished my internship after medical school. I wanted to stay in the big city, so the only job I could find was in the trauma department at City General. Ronnie, whom I married, was brought in one night after a soccer injury. I won't bore you with the details of our courtship, but suffice it to say that within two years we were married. I was 28 by then, and within a year we became parents to our son. 
Pamela didn't need to be a world-class psychologist to realize that Wendy was having a lot of trouble saying her firstborn's name. Wendy was so excited that she dropped the balloons out of her hands and had to chase them across the floor. Pamela helped by picking one up. She had never seen Wendy's balloons before, or rather, she had never seen them this close. Their appearance was unlike any others she had seen, but she couldn't figure out why. Once they were back in Wendy's hands, she visibly calmed down. We decided I was going to be a stay-at-home mom because Ronnie's business was picking up and the hours of work in the ER were frankly crazy. Of course, it wasn't conducive to starting a family and we always wanted two kids. So when my oldest was just a year and a half old, we had another son and I started taking birth control pills. Once again, the monologue was missing the names of the children. I stayed home until our youngest was five and went to school. Then someone remarked that if I didn't return to practice soon, I would lose my license. So I had to go back to the ER. Ronnie was very supportive of me, and fortunately his business was doing so well that he was able to change his work schedule to be home when the boys came home from school. We also hired a live-in nanny in case he just couldn't be around and to help with meal preparation. Ronnie was an orphan, and my parents were no longer alive by then. Around this time, we lost some doctors from the hospital, and things just got overwhelming. I was exhausted all the time. It was awful. Wendy paused, her look of anguish, and Pamela realized that they had come to the part of the story that greatly troubled her conscience. She waited. I don't know why it started, and I won't insult your intelligence by listing all the nonsense excuses I made up for myself. I realized they were bullshit after, after it all happened. At this point, Wendy bowed her head, but not before Pamela saw that tears were flowing, not just dripping from her eyes. Pamela hated to see such pain. She wondered how Wendy was able to endure such a depth of pain. How could the pain stay so strong and not linger? Pam wanted to hug her friend, but it was against the rules. So she waited. Finally, Wendy continued in a very quiet voice. Pam had to lean over to hear her properly. He was a new intern in the emergency room where I was assigned to be his mentor, my, my lover. Another long pause, more tears. Again, the grinding of stress balls. Pam furtively glanced at her watch, alarmed at how long this was taking. But worried about what might happen if she interrupted her, she decided to keep quiet and wait. At first, we only did it at the hospital, once every few days to relieve stress. But then, foolishly, I started going to his apartment after my shift was over. Hiding it from my family was easy. My work hours were so erratic. Ronnie didn't suspect a thing. I was a fool, Pam, just like you, acting that way with my toy chef. I guess I became addicted to sex. I could do anything with my lover that I was afraid to ask my husband to do. Good girls, just don't do some of the things we did. She stopped and shook her head, turning her exhausted gaze to Pam. Pam tensed, trying to suppress a shiver. She wanted to look away, but Wendy's gaze was too intense, too agonizing. Wrinkles of tension lingered in the corners of her eyes, her lips thinning with pain. It was too much. She didn't want to know Wendy's story anymore. Now every sentence made her feel like she was intruding on something too personal to share. And there would be worse to come. She could feel it. Ia, I got pregnant again. I don't know how. It just happened, I guess. Wendy was already sobbing hard. Pam just couldn't contain her thoughts. Was it your lover's baby? Wendy, too busy sobbing to answer verbally, just nodded, splashing tears down Pam's arm. She shuddered, afraid they were burning. Finally, Wendy pulled herself together. I was horrified by it. And he tried to get me to have an abortion, of course, but if there was one chance in a million that it was Ronnie's, I couldn't. I just couldn't. It drove a wedge between me and my lover, and I broke up with him. I, uh, I never found out who the father was. I still had sex with my husband occasionally. The baby could be his. This time I had a different pregnancy. The first two went smoothly, but in the sixth month of this pregnancy, I ended up in the hospital. The placenta had detached from the uterine wall and was preventing the baby from getting oxygen and nutrients. It wasn't growing, so I had to be on constant bed rest until it was possible to induce labor. Poor Ronnie with the help of the residents, had to do everything for our sons. They were scared and nervous, so he had to cut back on his workday to be with them more. It was such a stressful time for all of us. 
The boys would want to climb on me when they came to visit and cling when it was time for them to leave. The only positive thing about the whole situation was that it strengthened the already strong bond between Ronnie and the boys. That, and the fact that the boys became protective of the child. We had to tell them over and over again to be careful with mommy because the baby in mommy's tummy was sick. He was special. They actually took it to heart. When the baby girl was finally born, they didn't want to let anyone near her. She was an angel, a really good kid. I think she realized how much she was loved from the moment she was born. She immediately became the apple of my eye to me and Ronnie, and her brothers considered themselves her little protectors, her knights. She looked just like me. There was no outward sign that she was from Ron or my lover, nor did I want to know. As far as I was concerned, she was Ronnie's. He certainly didn't know that he might not be the father. Wendy stopped again and stared into infinity. Pam had known Wendy for five years, and this was the first time she had heard of her having a husband, two sons, and a daughter. As far as she knew, she is the only person close to Wendy. She herself is close to her mother and didn't understand how anyone could go a week without seeing her. She guessed from the way the waters were churning that there had to be more to this than just Ronnie finally getting his DNA tested and absconding with his sons and daughter. The courts always support the mother, no matter how angry she is. Pam assumed it happened when Wendy was in her early 30s. Something very strong had to have happened to still be in such pain and remorse, and she knew she had to proceed with caution. She didn't want to add to Wendy's pain, but at the same time, Pamela needed to get back to work. So how did Ronnie know Wendy? How did he know that his daughter wasn't really his? Wendy answered quickly and decisively. He didn't find out. Then what happened? Did he find out you had a lover? Did you tell him? The tears were no longer flowing. The well had clearly dried up. Not that stopping the tears had diminished the expression of pain on Wendy's face. On the contrary, she now looked as if her life had been sucked out of her, like a dried up husk. Pamela couldn't decide which was worse. No, I didn't tell him. The police did. What? After I'd done something really stupid. The words came out of Wendy's mouth like a horse on a straight line home. As far as Pam could tell, Wendy was following the rip the band-aid off quickly principle. When, uh, my daughter was about six months old, my ex-lover contacted me again. By then he was working at another hospital and we hadn't seen each other in over a year. I foolishly confronted him and showing my usual weakness, fell into his bed again. I started leaving the baby with the old nanny, whom we now used specifically as a nanny for half a day a week so that I could have time for myself. Oh no, Pamela thought. That silly cow has finally gotten sloppy and hubby found out about it. But it turned out to be much worse. It went on for about three months, but I had a guilty conscience. Ronnie was so supportive during my last pregnancy, it brought us closer together. It was like I fell in love with my husband all over again. He was wonderful. Even volunteered to have a vasectomy so I would never have to go through such a horrible pregnancy again. I felt as bad as I could possibly feel. I tried to break up with my lover several times, but I just couldn't. If I had been stronger, I, I, uh, I might still have a husband and kids. The last time I went to my lover's apartment, I was determined to persevere and break up with him. He told me a heartwarming story about how much he loved me and begged me for another date in bed. Wendy snorted, her gaze sarcastic. Pam saw in that look the extent of Wendy's self-loathing. If I had known that this was the last time I would ever have sex, I might have tried to enjoy myself more. Wendy stopped abruptly and stared into the void. Pamela was stunned by Wendy's revelation about how long she had gone without sex. She herself had once turned her husband off for three weeks once when she was angry at what he had done. But in the end, it was she who had crawled into bed with him, not Jake who had pursued her. The next series of events happened so quickly that Pamela saw them as a blur. Wendy, with a determined expression on her face, carefully placed the stress balls on her lap, and then, more than once or twice, smacked her face into the hard countertop. Blood flew in all directions, splattering Pamela. By the time Pamela reacted, Wendy's body had rolled sideways and fallen to the floor, her head banging quietly against the carpet. That muffled sound did nothing to lessen the horror of the situation. 
Wendy's entire body relaxed, continued unconscious, but blood continuously poured from her badly damaged face, staining the carpet. Years of training had allowed Pamela to set aside her personal feelings of shock and horror and raise the alarm. She didn't allow herself to feel as she cleared Wendy's airway of blood and damaged denture with practiced efficiency until other nurses came to the rescue and an ambulance arrived to take Wendy away. When the crisis passed, Pamela, feeling slightly overwhelmed by the morning's events, went about the more mundane tasks associated with the emergency, such as arranging furniture. She picked up Wendy's bag and headed to the administrative office before heading back to the sunroom to retrieve the stress balls from there. Examining them for blood spatter, she suddenly realized exactly what was odd about them. Usually stress balls are shiny and about two and a half centimeters in diameter. Wendy's balls, however, were tiny, just over a centimeter and all scuffed up. Apparently they had been mopped up while unconscious. The thought made Pamela feel sad. Wendy, for all her faults, had always been kind and friendly to her. Pam hated to see another human being suffer. It was the desire to reduce suffering that had gotten her into nursing. She put the balloons in her bag and turned toward the administration building again. As she passed two maintenance workers heading in the opposite direction, she smiled at them, pleased that her colleague had saved her the trouble of organizing the cleanup. Pamela glanced at her watch. What a morning. She wondered if there was any news on Wendy's condition yet. She could only hope that the broken nose and damaged dentures were the least of her injuries. Pamela still couldn't believe Wendy's actions. They were out of character for her. There was no way she expected Wendy to demand a conversation. Pamela quickened her step, eager to hand Wendy's bag to the administration staff, as entry to patient rooms was strictly forbidden while they were out. As she rounded the last corner before administration, she was called out by Dr. Parsons, the facility's chief medical officer. Ah, Nurse Dalrymple, just the person I was looking for. I'm told you've witnessed a rather traumatic event. Please step into my office and let's discuss the situation a bit, shall we? Pamela followed the kind doctor into his office located behind the main reception desk. He quickly and expertly elicited from her what had happened in the tanning salon. Pamela felt obliged to reveal the details of Wendy's confession in case she made another attempt at self-mutilation. Pamela was a little ashamed of her curiosity about the latest chapter in Wendy's story. She wouldn't call herself a gossip lover or enjoy the misfortune of others, but she couldn't deny a morbid desire to know more about Wendy. What could have happened to destroy her so completely? Many people have had affairs and divorced. Rightly or wrongly, most of them married again and led happy lives. They certainly didn't become celibate like Wendy or didn't engage in self-mutilation. Dr. Parsons tilted his head to the side, and Pamela blushed under his intense and assessing gaze. Being caught in an ill-concealed curiosity, she felt like a child caught with her hand in the cookie jar. It's all right, Pamela. It's natural to want to know the end of the story, and given the extent of Mrs. Harrison's confession, I'm sure that if guilt, shame, and remorse hadn't gotten the better of her, she would have told you the rest of the story herself. We had hoped that her days of sabotage were behind her. Mrs. Harrison has clearly grown attached to you, so I've decided to show you the section of her file on psychological factors that may be affecting her health. I think it will help you in your future care of her. I warn you, it's not a pretty story. In fact, it's tragic. Please tell me right now if you don't think you are strong enough to hear the truth. Pamela nodded for him to continue. What I'm about to tell you is taken directly from Mrs. Harrison's conversations with me during my time living here. So, where to begin? Dr. Parson looked at the folder in front of him and furrowed his brows. Uh, yeah. I'll start the story where Mrs. Harrison left off. The day she went to her lover's house to break up with him, the babysitter had an emergency call, something about a sick child at home. Anyway, Mrs. Harrison decided to take her nine-month-old daughter with her to her lover's house. According to Mrs. Harrison, the baby was asleep in the stroller when Mrs. Harrison and her lover went into the bedroom to have sex. Fire investigators have not decided exactly what happened, but they believe it is likely that the baby woke up and managed to crawl out of the stroller. They believe she may have knocked over one of the candles or a scented oil lamp that the lover had lit for the sake of seduction. Apparently, he placed them all over the apartment because he knew Mrs. Harrison was partial to them. 
By the way, Mrs. Harrison has hated scented candles ever since. Anyway, by the time the couple noticed smoke under the bedroom door, the apartment was on fire. According to Mrs. Harrison, when she opened the door, she was greeted by a wall of flames. She says her lover pushed her out the window and jumped out after her. She tried to climb back in to save her daughter, but her lover stopped her, and when she begged him to come back and save the child, he refused. The child's body was found in the ashes. Her only good fortune was that she died of smoke inhalation before she could burn. Dr. Parsons paused to let the horror of the story reach the listener. Pamela swallowed several times, afraid she was about to vomit on the doctor's desk. Wendy's story was far worse than she could have imagined. The word tragic was an understatement. Wendy's baby, her poor, innocent little girl, had died, nine months old. She couldn't even begin to comprehend the guilt and devastation Wendy felt. The very next day, the police informed her husband of the child's fate and the circumstances under which it had happened. Her husband, of course, blamed her for everything, divorced her for cheating on him, and got custody of the boys. At Pamela's raised eyebrows, the doctor explained, Mrs. Harrison lost custody of her sons because by then she had already attempted suicide, thus proving herself unstable and unfit to care for two young boys. The two sons, who I am sure Mrs. Harrison admitted to you earlier, were extremely protective of their younger sister, never contacted her again. She has not had any sexual relations since then because the mere thought of it causes her PTSD. As you know, she had sex while her baby was dying. Despite our best efforts, we were never able to cure her of that disorder. At that moment, his cell phone rang. Pamela was relieved. Even though he had assured her that she was strong enough to listen to Wendy's story in full, she wasn't sure she could take much more. It was all too horrible. She wanted to walk away and digest everything she'd learned. Dr. Parsons stood up, asked the person he was talking to to wait, then quietly told Pamela that he needed to take a call and asked her to meet him the next day. He pulled what she realized was a permission slip from the tray and held it out to her. With this, he was giving Pam permission to enter Wendy's room to return the valise and make sure everything was in order, and it was okay to leave it, possibly for a long time. He let her out of the office, but before she could head in the direction of Wendy's room, she was stopped by the person in charge of facility security, asking her to fill out a preliminary report on the incident that had happened after lunch. Pamela sighed. She just wanted to be alone to comprehend everything she had heard. Even though she had omitted the details of the conversation with Wendy that preceded the sabotage incident, she had to write the simple words, Mrs. Harrison was upset by memories of the past, to conjure up Wendy's terrible words and her face. Pamela didn't think she could ever forget the degree of pain she had seen on Wendy's face. She placed the report in the manila paper envelope that the security officer had provided and closed the folder, preparing to hand it over when she noticed that it was already labeled with Wendy's information. Even before Wendy's confession, she was curious about her age, but the date of birth was listed right there on the cover of the folder, and Pamela mentally wrote it down in her mind. Finally finished with all of the protocols that had been made for Wendy's sabotage incident, Pamela went straight to Wendy's room and entered it using the master key. She closed the door behind her and leaned against it, surveying the room with a new, more knowledgeable eye. Being part of an institution, the wards themselves were fairly ordinary, though Pamela had seen some of the innkeepers personalizing their rooms, making them more cozy. Many attended craft workshops and made things to decorate their wards. Wendy didn't do much for hers. It looked like a motel room with beautiful but neglected watercolor still life paintings on the wall and tastefully chosen but equally neglected pillows and rugs. Pamela had been to Wendy's room before, but for the first time she was struck by the lack of personal belongings. There were no photographs or memorabilia. The ward had an open floor plan. The kitchenette, dining room, and living room were all in the same room. She put her purse on the kitchen counter, washed a dirty cup, transferred milk from the bag to the small bar fridge, and generally cleaned up the small living room. On the kitchen bench lay an opened A4 envelope. The edges were torn, as if it had been attacked by a puppy. This detail surprised Pamela. Wendy was always so elegant and neat. 
She looked like someone who opened mail with a letter opener. The envelope gave the bench an unkempt look, but Pamela didn't know where to put it, so she left it where it was. She was curious to know its contents. Was it Wendy's last will and testament? Some kind of legal documents? Pamela's curiosity was piqued, but she resisted the temptation to look inside. After tidying up the living room, Pamela opened the door to the bedroom. It was the first time she had ever been in Wendy's bedroom. Wendy usually kept the door to it closed. The room was spacious, the bed neatly made, but it was the walls that caught Pamela's attention. Along each wall hung photographs in simple black frames of varying sizes. Pamela wondered why Wendy didn't hang them in her living room. A closer look revealed that they were arranged chronologically, starting on the right side of the bed. The first was a black and white photograph of a radiant young woman in a wedding dress standing next to a tall, handsome man, their hands intertwined, standing in front of a car with tin cans and boots tied to the back of it. Wendy looks beautiful, thought Pamela, with her fine facial features and large eyes, the epitome of a radiant bride. The next series of photographs were distinctly schoolboy, two smiling boys in uniforms, hats and ties. Pamela smiled at their toothless grins. In the younger of the two, she saw a bit of Wendy, and in the older one, she saw the man from the wedding photo. They were obviously Wendy's sons. Pamela wondered what their names were. Next to the school pictures was a picture taken outside the church. Apparently the same man as in the first wedding photo, but a different bride, and they weren't looking at the camera. The husband had remarried, Pam speculated. She wondered who had taken the picture and shared it with Wendy. Maybe a friend? How hard it was for Wendy to see her ex-husband's happiness, to see him move on with his life. Pamela knew that if she ever lost Jake, it would kill her. A quick glance at the remaining photos revealed that the school pictures of Wendy's sons were the last of the staged photos. One photo on the first wall caught Pamela's attention in that it didn't depict a single person at any given moment in time. Rather, it was a sad shot of a lonely tombstone. The headstone was very beautiful, made of black granite, with a beautiful carving of an angel and flowers along one side of the front. Pamela moved closer to read the inscription, Sophie Harrison. So that was the name of Wendy's daughter. Pamela's heart clenched slightly at the sight of the inscription. Caution, an angel is buried here. She heard Wendy's voice again, describing her little girl as an angel, and felt the pain of losing Wendy again. Swallowing the lump in her throat, Pamela moved on to the next two pictures. They were taken from a distance. Apparently, they were snapshots of two prom nights. Wendy's sons? To their right are two more wedding shots taken near two churches with two different brides and grooms. Wendy's sons again, Pamela thought. Pamela turned to the next wall. There were two collections with pictures of different children. Pamela couldn't help but smile. The pictures depicted children in motion. There were smiling, sweaty faces running on slender legs across a soccer field, cute little ballerinas, determined faces with a bat ready to knock a ball out of the park. Wendy's grandchildren were cute and wonderful. They made Pamela think of her two pranksters. They too love soccer and baseball. Yet altogether, deep down, these photographs told a horrific story of isolation. In none of the photos did the child look at the camera that had captured this moment in his life for all eternity. In none of the photos was the child smiling directly at the camera, at the person taking the picture. This created the effect of excluding the viewer from the captured scene. Pamela continued her slow journey around the room. Each series of photographs captured significant events as well as family outings. After circling the entire room, Pamela moved to the center and slowly turned around. Her gaze swept over all the photographs and the horror they told of. A wave of devastation swept through her. No wonder Wendy always looked melancholy. No wonder even her smiles looked sad. On a whim, Pamela went back into the living room and picked up an A4 envelope. She shook it slightly, and two sheets slipped out onto the tabletop. One sheet was another photograph. Pamela picked it up. It showed a small child, probably about 18 months old, Pamela thought. He was cute, with blonde curls and a wide smile. Pamela could almost hear his laughter as the smiling older man rocked him on the swing, and the older woman stood at the man's shoulder and laughed. 
The man might have been older and grayer, his shoulders not as broad and straight, but he was still recognizable. It was Ronnie Harrison, Wendy's husband. The other sheet with the header of a private investigation company was simply a report. Dear Mrs. Harrison, I'm enclosing a photograph of your last great-grandson as you requested. We believe he has been named Joshua. The man rocking him has been identified as Ronald Harrison. The woman is Jennifer Harrison. Please contact us if we can be of further assistance. Pamela took the photograph in her hands again. She knew exactly what she needed to do with it. She rummaged through Wendy's drawers and found several pins. Solemnly entering the bedroom with the photograph, she pinned it above the bed. There was only one spot left if she wanted to keep the photos of her husband, children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren in sequence. The photo wasn't framed like the others, but something told Pamela it should be added to Wendy's collection. She looked around the room again. Everything was so depressingly tragic. Each photograph was a testament to a life lived remotely by a woman who had never seen her descendants in the flesh, only through the lens of a detective. Wendy had paid a heavy price for her poor choices, her selfishness and stupidity. Pamela knew she should leave, but somehow she couldn't bring herself to do it. Feeling the urge, she stood in front of the first picture, Wendy and Ronnie's wedding picture. Still smiling, she studied Wendy's face. She looked so happy, radiant. She was smiling at Ronnie, her face streaked with love. Pamela had never seen such an expression on her 91-year-old friend's face. How did a woman who so clearly loved her husband lose that love? How could she betray him? Something, a realization, a truth, burst out of its cage in Pamela's mind. This room could be hers. This future could be hers, too. It could be her life. Old and alone, living in a nursing home, with no visits, without anyone to love her. A life lived through someone else's telescopic lens. In the end, Wendy is right. She really needed to hear her story. Taking one last look at a life lived in vain, Pamela sent Randall a text message asking him to never contact her again. Relief swept over her. She felt as if she had managed to emerge unscathed from a car accident. She couldn't wait to get home and hug her sons. She felt an overwhelming need to hold them close and never let them go. She needed to hug her husband and tell him how much she loved and appreciated him. Needed them to know that they were her world, now and forever. Of course, by morning, she'd want to strangle them all again for dropping their dirty laundry on their bedroom floor, but she couldn't think of three other people she'd want to both hug and strangle at the same time.